if we compare the economic competition between China and the U.S. Uh, as if it were a series of events analogous to the ski jumps or snowboard feats that we're watching at the current Beijing Olympics, could China be winning gold? In real dollars, 2015 dollars, uh, China's GDP was $260 billion when Nixon and Kissinger showed up there 50 years ago. It's grown more than 50-fold. I'm not about for giving up our team. I put a tenth question here. Who attracts the most talent from the world and gives them the most opportunities? And you'll see here for immigrant inventors, it's USA. Basically, people leave China, and fortunately, some of the best ones come to the U.S. And I think, fortunately, from my point of view, this is a great sustainable advantage for the U.S. because China insists on not naturalizing anybody. It's almost impossible to become a Chinese citizen. And the U.S., when we're at our best, recruit and welcome and give opportunities to people of talent from wherever they come and encourage them to realize their dreams. Overall, you know, my take is that China has won gold so far um, in the economic rivalry. However, the growing um, economic prosperity in China has really come at a significant environmental cost um, for China specifically and more broadly for the world when we, when we think about this from a climate change point of view. However, I'd say um, neither country has meddled. <laughs> Um, in demonstrating a low-carbon development model. Uh, both the Chinese and American growth stories are really compelling in their different ways. But both of these growth models were very carbon-intensive growth models. Apart from what you said, Graham, uh, about poverty alleviation, which is so real, I would add uh, to the winning gold factor uh, something a little bit different and less discussed, which is uh, female empowerment. And... Um, of course, female empowerment comes with economic development, but the one-child policy, uh, the one-child policy generation, of which I was the first, among the first, uh, started in the 1980s, uh, did a number of things, of which the most important is contribute, or sorry, control the population spiral, um, but also led to much higher education for the only child of the family, but unexpectedly, um, unprecedented female empowerment, which is why we see so many female CEOs, female leaders in the political and uh, business uh, arena. I think framing things in terms of who's the biggest and who's the best is misleading as a guide to people's welfare, is damaging in terms of its prospects for avoiding uh, conflict, and it's just not the right way to think about economic comparison. China has about 4.2 times as many people as the United States does. In fact, if China has the same GDP that the United States does, that would correspond to its GDP per capita being about where the United States was in 1950. And if it has this, and since it has a much higher share of its resources devoted to investment, and a much lower share devoted to consumption, it would correspond to its living standards, its consumption per person, being about where the United States was in 1930. I think it's important in thinking about Chinese growth to recognize that China is going to have something that's almost without precedent, a substantially shrinking labor force over the next uh decade. And we don't have a lot of experience on the question of what that means for countries. The one experience we do have is Japan, and it's not a encouraging uh, read. Apart from Larry's comments about the uh, labor force shrinking, Chinese productivity has been the major contributor to effective labor force growth, whereas in the last decade, decade, manufacturing productivity has grown by more than 10 percent. And that is also as important as the reduction in labor force where we're going to see everywhere else around the country. The, the other small, small comment on the labor force is at least when I last talked to Lu Ha, who's a Kennedy School 
graduate and who's playing a key role for Xi in running the economic program, he said, you know, wait a minute, we have a retirement age of 60. You have a retirement age of 65. So we can simply extend our retirement age to make it to essentially compensate for the labor shortage that we would otherwise face. So my bet would be we'll see the, the a retirement age extended. How should the U.S. and other Western nations respond to China's efforts to leverage climate mitigation technology and infrastructure as a tool of geopolitical influence? Certainly China's commitments in the international arena in the context of the global climate negotiations have been an opportunity for China to exercise soft power in the Joe Nye kind of way we think about it. And I feel like the U.S. has been a little bit asleep during this period, assuming it can catch up or dominate, but already it feels almost too late unless a very concerted action is taken soon. For the panel tonight, I would just want to say thank you very much, and I apologize that we ran people over late. <laughs>